All righty, let's do section 2.2 norms with our goal of dealing with normed linear spaces. <clears throat> so we'll introduce a norm on a linear space. We've been introduced to linear spaces and to metrics. And we'll use this norm to uh, quote unquote induce a metric, use that term before, uh, the same way you do in sophomore linear algebra in vector spaces. And once we have a metric, we're good to go to address topological ideas, analysis ideas, things like open and closed sets and limits of sequences and continuous functions and connected sets and all that kind of thing. So a norm on a linear space is a mapping, little double absolute values, <coughs> commonly used to introduce, to uh, indicate the norm of a vector. And it's a mapping of the linear space, the vectors in the linear space, to the non-negative real numbers, such that for any x and y vectors, and for all scalars alpha, at least for now, we're taking the scalars to be from some field. Normally that field's the real or the complex numbers, more of that in a second. And we impose the three conditions that the norm of the sum x plus y is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y, triangle inequality in the norm setting. The norm of scalar alpha times vector x is the absolute value of scalar alpha times a norm of x, called the scalar property. And more of this in a second. If I choose alpha from an arbitrary field, there's a little extra structure that we need to uh, have the scalar property even be meaningful. And finally, the norm of x equals zero implies that x is the unique zero vector. <clears throat> That's a norm together, the norm and the linear space itself form a normed linear space uh, about that scalar. We need uh, actually need some idea like absolute value on field F for the scalar property to make sense. Really, we need, a, we need a norm on the scalar field itself. For us in here, the scalar field will always be the reals or the complex numbers. So the little symbols here mean the absolute value of alpha, be it real or complex. If you like, you might call it modulus when we're dealing with complex numbers. But for us, always real or complex numbers and all these things make sense. The norm, on a linear space induces a metric. Define the metric D of X, Y simply to be the norm of X minus Y, the norm of the distance. Uh, in the real numbers, this is how you deal with a metric using absolute values. Uh, in RN, it's how you measure distances between vectors as well. <clears throat> and with the appropriate geometric interpretation, how you measure distances between points in RN. Uh, for a metric, we needed a triangle inequality. We'll have a triangle inequality. It will follow from the triangle inequality for norms, different settings, both times called triangle inequality. Uh, we required something related to this in terms of uh, a metric as well as part of the definition. Uh, so it's easily verified that defining um, metric D in this way satisfies the definition of a metric as well. All right, some examples with which you're certainly familiar. Consider RN or CN. Uh, we can define the, the familiar Euclidean norm, the usual norm uh, on RN or CN. Uh, we're gonna indicate this with a subscript of two details to follow on why this is. Um, but on our end, we're defining this particular norm. We're going to index with a two, still just the Euclidean norm, simply to be for a vector x1 through x sub n, components x1 through x sub n. <clears throat> take the sum from k equals one to n of the components square, x sub k squared, and then take a square root. And that determines a norm on Rn. That's the norm on Rn that you use in sophomore linear algebra. The two norm, the Euclidean norm on Cn, fairly similar. 
we'll take a sum from one to n, but we'll take x sub k times a conjugate of x sub k. And together this yields the modulus squared of x sub k provided those components are complex numbers. So we're getting a modulus squared from this computation, writing it in terms of conjugates, a complex number and its conjugate. Well, that's the same thing we got up here. We could have, we have put absolute values around this and express this as an absolute value square. You don't need the absolute values with the real numbers. You do with the complex numbers. But these are very, very similar um, norms. But we need to make sure when we take a norm, we are dealing with real numbers. So when we do the sums of these norm squares, we get something that's non negative in the square roots and it's real in particular. Uh, another norm called the L1 norm on Rn and Cn is defined by, we'll subscript this one with a one, summing up the um, absolute values or moduli, if you prefer that term in the complex setting, summing up the um, moduli of the components. Now there's a similarity, we want to draw similarity between this one on Rn and this one treated as if it's on um, Rn as well. Here we're summing from 1 to n, say the absolute value squared, square root of. Here we're summing the absolute value to the first power, first root of. This is an L1 norm, sometimes it's called an L2 norm. We could actually, with absolute values, replace that 2 with a parameter p and replace this 2 with a parameter p, provided p is greater than or equal to 1. That produces another kind of norm called an LP norm. More to follow on that, much more to follow on LP norms. But in the LP space setting, that's where the Euclidean norm and say the L1 norm that we've mentioned here sort of come under a common umbrella. When P equals two, we get this norm. When P equals one, we get this norm. In fact, for any P greater than or equal to one, we can similarly produce an LP norm. Uh, for what's stated here, uh, it's easy to see that uh, both of these alleged norms satisfy properties uh, two and three, the scalar property and the thing about a vector of norm zero having to be the zero vector. It's usually the triangle inequality that's the tricky thing. Uh, it's easy enough to see the triangle inequality holds for this L1 norm because absolute value uh, or modulus satisfies a triangle inequality. So it follows fairly easily that uh, this L1 norm also satisfies a triangle inequality. <clears throat> Actually, with a Euclidean norm, it's a, I worded it as a more of a chore to show the Euclidean norm satisfies a triangle inequality. And you will see the same approach in establishing the triangle inequality in here and possibly other classes be the same argument that you use in sophomore linear algebra you establish the triangle inequality in sophomore linear algebra using the Schwartz inequality. Sometimes it's called a Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. <clears throat> Once you've established the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, then establishing the triangle inequality for the Euclidean norm is, is straightforward. Uh, but it's a little bit of a trick sometimes to establish the the Schwartz inequality, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. We will see this exact same thing done later on. Here's a link to some notes, actually the very second section uh, of my notes on linear algebra. So it happens early on in, in the book I like, the two vectors early on. Uh, it's presented in the second section that uh, we have a Schwartz inequality and that, that can be used to establish the triangle inequality. So totally accessible at the sophomore level in RN. <clears throat> We're going to be in more exotic settings than RN. Then we'll have a more exotic Schwartz inequality. Probably that's where we'll call it the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. We can use the triangle inequality to establish the so-called backwards triangle inequality, which says the absolute value of the norm of X minus the norm of Y. Notice the symbols. So we got an absolute value of a difference of two real numbers. Norms are real numbers. Is less than or equal to the norm of X minus Y. 
x and y are vectors. How can you tell? Because we're taking a norm of them. You take the norms of vectors, you don't take norms of scalars, that thing about not really distinguishing notationally between vectors and scalars, but you can tell from the setting, the context. So let's establish two things that the norm of x minus y is greater than or equal to norm of x minus norm of y, and it's greater than or equal to norm of y minus norm of x. And then we can justify the insertion of the absolute values. The norm of x, we can write as the norm of x minus y plus y, which really just added nothing in there, the zero vector. By the triangle inequality, that vector sum is less than or equal to x minus y norm of plus y norm of. So split it at the addition, use the triangle inequality. Take the norm of y to the left-hand side of this inequality, and we get norm of x minus norm of y moves over is less than or equal to norm of x minus y. The roles played by x and y are perfectly symmetric in this. We could interchange x and y and show that the norm of y minus the norm of x is less than or equal to uh, y minus x, which is the same as x minus y. We can use a scalar property if you like to justify that. So anyhow, <clears throat> we've got the norm of uh, x minus y greater than or equal to norm of y minus norm of x, and also greater than or equal to norm of x minus norm of y. That justifies putting the absolute values on here. So the backwards triangle inequality, uh, admittedly, I think it's the first book I've heard that, that went as far as giving that a name. It's usually just a little simple observation that follows from the triangle inequality. All right, uh, let's consider sequences. Uh, suppose x sub n and y sub n are sequences in a normed linear space. Alpha sub n is a sequence in the field. Uh, we'll need to have um, a norm on that field uh, as well, like an absolute value in order to talk about convergence in the field. Uh, but for us, not a problem because for us that field is either the reals or the complex numbers. Suppose the sequence of vectors x sub n has a limit of x, the sequence of vectors y sub n has a limit of y, and the sequence of scalars alpha sub n has a limit of alpha. Then, so two convergent sequences of vectors, one convergent sequence of scalars, claim is the limit of the vector sum x sub n plus y sub n is the sum of the limits, limit of x sub n plus limit of y sub n. Secondly, the limit of alpha sub n times x sub n equals the limit of alpha sub n times the limit of x sub n. Limit of a product equals a product of the limits. Very specific setting here, because I can't take a product of two vectors. I can take a product of a scalar with a vector, so set, setting dependent. And the limit of the norm of x sub n equals the norm of x itself. So first argument, pretty straightforward. It's an epsilon over two argument. Uh, second, or sorry, third, third claim, uh, limit of the norm of x sub n equals the norm of x. And that's really just a claim about a sequence of real numbers. Let's take a look at the proof. Actually, the first and the third parts are left as exercise 2.2 in the book. So let's concentrate on the second one. All right, this one's a touch more exotic anyhow. Limit of the scalar product, alpha sub n with x sub n, is the limit of the scalars times the limit of the vectors. To paraphrase, so let's establish that. We need a little result from senior level analysis. Alpha sub n is a convergent sequence. Convergent sequences are bounded. Standard result from senior level analysis. Uh, here's a link where that result is established for a sequence of uh, real numbers, uh, though it holds uh, in broader settings as well. But we're just dealing with scalars. Our scalars are ultimately going to be either real or complex. And the argument given uh, in these notes for a sequence of real numbers is easily extendable. So anyhow, we'll take this sequence to be bounded. So there's some k of non-negative real number such that 
that sequence alpha sub n is bounded by parameter k, that is the absolute value of alpha sub n is less than or equal to k, and this holds for all values of the index. So first observation, sequence is convergent, so it's bounded. Sequence of scalars is convergent, and so it's bounded. Okay, uh, we've hypothesized that the x sub n sequence converges to x. We've stated limits of sequences in the previous section in terms of metrics. Here the metric is given by the norm of the difference. So this is equivalent to saying the limit of the norm of x sub n minus x equals zero. Think of it as the distance from x sub n to x has a limit of zero. So x sub n approaches x. And that's the very definition. Similarly, over here, we had the alpha sub n's converge to alpha. So the limit of the absolute value of alpha sub n minus alpha equals zero. Again, it's the definition. So well, we're trying to show alpha sub n x sub n has a limit of alpha x. We'll show that by showing the limit of the norm of the difference. Remember, this, this is, the, is the metric. So the distance between this and that has a limit of zero. The limit of the norm of the difference less than or equal to zero. Norms are non-negative. We've got it bounded below by zero, of course, and here we're showing it's bounded above by zero. When we draw the conclusion that the limit of this quantity is zero, which establishes the limit of this sequence is that constant. The limit of this sequence is that constant. And here's the justification. Okay, norm of this difference, let's write as um, alpha sub n x sub n, let's insert a minus alpha sub n x and a plus alpha sub n x. There's the minus alpha of x on the side. We just inserted this, that's zero, zero vector. So certainly those things are equal. Let's use a triangle inequality and split this up right there over that vector addition. You know the norm of the sum is less than or equal to the sum of the norms, triangle inequality, and using a limit property of real numbers, limit of the sum is the sum of the limits when the constituent parts exist. So we've used triangle inequality and a proper of lim property of limits there. We split it up the way we split it up because then We've got a common alpha sub n that can be brought outside of this norm. It'll come outside with an absolute value on it, scalar property, as we called it, of, of norms. Um, this limit has a common x, so we can take the x, factor it out, so get the norm of x times this. Technically, it's a scalar that we're factoring out. Again, it's a scalar property. Now, this limit less than or equal to these two limits here. How about this? Um, alpha sub n, absolute value of, we got a bound on that. Okay, it's convergent sequence, so it's bounded. So we've got this bounded by k, so we'll replace the absolute value of alpha sub n with k, introducing an inequality. And then we can bring that constant outside of the first limit. So we've used the bound given here and brought the constant outside of the limit. Again, these, these limits in these definitions are all limits like you dealt with in calculus two. They're limits of sequences of real numbers. So we're freely using those properties. Over here, we can bring the norm of X outside of that limit because it's constant. Well, it's a limit as N approaches infinity and there aren't any ends there. It's constant with respect to N. So we'll bring the norm of X out. All right, and we got into this by saying, hey, the limit of this norm is zero and the limit of this absolute value is also zero. This limit zero, this limit zero, then we get, an e, we get the zero scalar out on this side. So we've got the limit of the norm is less than or equal to zero. Of course, a norm is always non-negative. So the limit of this must actually equal zero. In other words, the limit of the sequence alpha sub n x sub n must equal alpha x by the definition of limit of a sequence. So of those three claims, 
when really that's the trickiest one, and there's a proof of that. Okay, uh, the book presents the following, uh, which is not in the least bit surprising. And the statement is uniqueness of limits. Uh, if a sequence X of N in a norm linear space converges to both X and Y, then X and Y are the same. So a convergent sequence has a unique limit, in other words. Not in the least bit surprising, and the surprising thing is that there's some settings, and this is to learn more about it, look into non-Hausdorff topological spaces. I've got a little commentary in my senior level analysis one notes that deals with this. There's actually a specific example. What a topological space is, is a, a bit of a story. It's not a very long story. It's a story I can tell as a supplemental conversation in analysis one, so it's not that involved. But there are places where sequences can converge to more than one thing. <clears throat> Probably not the place you want to do applied math because you're going to need sequences to be unique. Uh, you approximate complicated problems with relatively easy things and then take limits is, is a broad idea of what um, applied math is. When well, you need those limits to be unique, you need them to exist and be unique. So that leads to certain analytic considerations. One of them is the limits of uh, a sequence, if it exists, better be unique. But there are exotic places out there where that doesn't hold. I mean, that's the reason we go to the trouble to even mention it here. Proof of this, very, very straightforward. All right, so we've got uh, a metric defined on linear spaces, the metric induced by the norm. So we can look at topological properties of linear spaces, analytic properties, open sets, closed sets, compact sets, continuity, convergence of sequences, another analytic idea, and we just consider that. Okay, so we're going to define um, two kind of fundamental sets in normed linear spaces. The open R ball centered at vector X, B of X R defined to be all vectors in the normed linear space such that, if you will, the distance from X to Y is less than R. That includes X itself. Passing comment will take R to be uh, positive whenever referring to these things. So this always includes X itself. Uh, and in fact, it includes all vectors Y that are within distance R of the fixed vector X. Notice the set here on the right-hand side of this equation has, in, in a sense, Y as a variable. It's all vectors Y within a distance, lowercase r, of X in a strict inequality sense of that distance. <clears throat> the open ball uh, of radius R and center X. Closed ball of center R and radius R, the closed R ball centered at X uh, is defined as, uh, they put a bar over it to indicate the closure though we haven't even defined open and closed sets yet, but we'll do it in terms of these ideas here. It is all vectors y in the norm linear space x, such that the distance from x to y is less than or equal to r. So the open r ball centered at x is a subset of the closed r ball centered at x. In fact, the only difference between these two is this includes all y vectors, which are distance exactly r from X. It's the um, the surface of the ball, and I don't want to read too much into this because we don't, we can't talk about dimensions and so forth, uh, but the kind of the idea is if it was two dimensions, it would be the, the outer circle enclosing the, the disk. If it was uh, three dimensions, it'd be the surface of a sphere, the extra part on the closure versus the open ball. So we'll take the radius to be positive, as commented. Using that, we can define, I mean, our real goal here is to define an open set, but we can define certain kind of points associated with a set. So this is drinking from the fire hose of definitions, 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 getting this topology set up. For any set in a normal linear space, X, 
and x a vector of that norm linear space, x is an interior point of A if a ball of center x and radius r is a subset of set A for some radius greater than zero. Really the standard kind of definition uh, that you'd see for um, interior point in other settings, complex variables, um, the book I like, Churchill and Brown, takes a similar approach, approach to topology and defines a lot of these similar ideas. Uh, exterior point of A, if we have an interior point of A complement. So we snuck in a little notation here, the A with a superscript of C refers to all of the vectors outside of set A, A complement. So vector X is an exterior point, which they call them vectors instead of points, but they're kind of muddling that distinction in this book. Uh, we'll refer to it as an exterior point of A if X is an interior point of A complement. That means there's a little ball of center X and radius R that's a subset of A complement. So for some R greater than zero, this doesn't intersect set A if X is an exterior point. X is a boundary point of A if it's neither an interior nor an exterior point. So neither of these two things happen. That means if you take any ball around a boundary point X, then it contains some points of A and some points of A complement. If it contained no points of A, you'd have yourself a, an exterior point of A. We'd have something like this happening. Uh, if it contains no points of A complement, then you got yourself an interior point. So to have neither of those occur can be described in terms of um, how the balls centered at X behave. Any ball around boundary point X, centered at boundary point X, if you like, has to contain points both in A and in A complement. And so boundary point's a reasonable thing to call it. It's a point that's really close to set A and possibly in set A. And it's also really close to the, uh, the outside of set A, the complement of set A, and possibly in the complement of set A. Uh, our book, Promise Slow, doesn't mention a limit point, at least not at this stage. But let's go ahead and insert that as well. A limit point of set A, uh, X is a limit point if, for all R greater than zero, the ball, center X and radius R, contains a point of A distinct from X itself. So um, we'll deal with limit points and sequences and um, closure of a set here shortly, which is why I want to insert, insert this idea. Uh, the set of all boundary points is denoted with common notation. It's the same symbol they use for partial derivative, uh, but this is a common symbol for the boundary of a set. All right, so finally, we can simply define open and closed sets. Set A in a norm linear space is open if all points of A are interior points of A. All right, um, we'll say this in a note below, but that means we have an open set if for every point X in that set, there's a ball of center X and radius R for some radius positive. It's a subset of set A. That's very much how you dealt with open, the definition of an open set in senior level analysis, for example. Uh, calculus, I don't think you ever quite go to open sets. I mean, you talk about open intervals and closed intervals, but I don't think in general you talk about open sets and closed sets, not in the calculus sequence. So definition of an open set, our definition of a closed set is set A in a norm linear space is closed if it contains all its boundary points. Again, the complex variables book I like takes a similar approach to this. Possibly not how you saw it in, um, in senior level real analysis though. So let's make some observations about that. Uh, if A is open, then it contains uh, none of its boundary points so by definition, 
uh, boundary point of uh, A is also a boundary point of A complement. So for A open, we must have A complement closed. In fact, that's a more common definition of closed that you probably saw in senior level analysis. The set's closed if its complement is open. So this idea here, complements of open sets are closed. Um, the idea of um, all points being interior points, very similar to an epsilon idea that you would see in senior level analysis. Complements, uh, let's see, complements of open sets are closed. How about this? Uh, some sets are both open and closed. Uh, vacuously, the empty set is both open and closed. Uh, statement is vacuously true. If it's true because it reads something like, for all X, blah, 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 and there are no X. Okay, well, it's vacuously satisfied. Uh, for all X uh, in the empty set, you make whatever claim you want. It's vacuously true. So the empty set's open and it's closed. And the whole space is also uh, both open and closed, if you like, because it's complement of the empty set. Um, I might argue trivially, I can get from the definitions that the whole space is both open and closed. And there's a subtle difference between vacuously true and trivially true. Vacuously true because there's nothing to show. Trivially true because what's to be shown uh, is super straightforward. And it makes a claim about X's in a set, but it's here we're talking about the set of all X's. Mm. This doesn't say these are the only sets that are both open and closed. That depends a bit more on some of the properties of the norm linear space. There could be other sets that are both open and closed, but always the empty set and the whole space itself are both open and closed. In analysis one, it's shown as well as it is in other places uh, in analysis classes in general, uh, but in you deal with the real numbers in analysis one, more than likely. An arbitrary union of open sets is open and a finite intersection of open sets is open. We could say similar things about closed sets from De Morgan's laws. We could say an arbitrary intersection of closed sets is closed and a finite union of closed sets is, is closed. What happened when we went from um, open sets to closed sets we changed union to intersection in both cases, keeping the finite and arbitrary in the in respective places. Um, if you've taken senior level analysis, you've even classified um, sets in terms of how they relate to open sets and closed sets in terms of unions and intersections, countable unions and intersections in uh, graduate real analysis one. Uh, proofs of these are given in uh, the senior level analysis class. There's a link to some notes on that. And these same properties um, also hold in linear spaces, in norm linear spaces. Arbitrary um, unions of open sets are open. Arbitrary intersections of closed sets are closed. And then stuff about finite intersections. Another result I mentioned because we need this in uh, a proof of one of the upcoming results. We can show a set's closed if and only if it contains all its limit points. And that might even sound familiar to you, another result on the topology of the real numbers. We're going to take that as given, even though it's not directly mentioned in Promise Lowe's book. All right. Following definition could be stated in terms of epsilons. The text takes a different route. Um, states this in terms of um, R ball centered at X. I prefer epsilons and deltas. You got a metric, so you may as well use it. Um, but the book states continuity of a function as follows. Suppose F is a function mapping one norm linear space into another one. We got two norm linear spaces, so we'll need two norms. Norm subscripted with an X and a norm subscripted with a Y, say. Function F is, by definition, continuous at point X, lowercase x, in the first norm linear space. If 
Given any open ball B prime around F of X, there is an open ball B around X itself, such that F of B is a subset of B prime. All right, let me try to talk you into believing this is the same thing you did in calculus one. So when you talk continuity of a function at a point in calculus one, there's epsilons and deltas, and there's an idea about making function values arbitrarily close to some number L by making the input values, the X values, sufficiently close to some number X sub zero, maybe, or A. Well, it's all right there. The epsilon part would be for all epsilon greater than zero. Idea being, Epsilon can be made small, and you're going to make function values close together. Here is the epsilon part, given any open ball B prime. And then the idea is uh, B prime could be uh, really small in radius. Remember, open ball is defined in terms of a center and a radius. The idea here is we could make B prime be an open ball with a small, really small radius. Uh, it's, say, centered at f of x. So we've got output values at point x. We've got the output value f of x. This is a really small radius ball that contains f of x. And what we're saying is there exists there is an open ball around X itself, such that whenever you take X values from this open ball B, you get function values that are really close to F of X. You get output values that are a subset of B prime. And B prime is some open ball <coughs> whose radius could be made arbitrarily small about uh, F of X. So this is the delta part. So the idea is if you choose X values sufficiently close to, sorry, let me say that again. If you choose input values sufficiently close to vector X, that's the, the B stuff. It's also the Delta stuff in calculus one. Then you will get output values F of those input values that are within epsilon, within this open ball of f of x. Input values sufficiently close to x, output values can be made arbitrarily close to f of x with a sufficiently and arbitrarily wo woven together with great care. But this is the same thing you do in calculus one, only described in terms of open balls instead of epsilons and deltas. It really is the same thing. Uh, a function under those conditions is called a continuous function if it's continuous at each point uh, of the domain, each vector x of the uh, domain. Domain is x, what's the range? I don't know, uh, but the range lives in y. It's commonly called a codomain. It's where the outputs go. So they, this may not be an onto function and this may not be the range. We went through that earlier. All right, um, you've done this before because you've done it in senior level analysis. Uh, if F is continuous, uh, then for any open set in the codomain, the inverse image, F inverse of that open set is open. Inverse images of open sets are open under continuous functions. Uh, Possibly this could be taken as the definition of uh, continuity as well in certain settings, possibly in a topological space that's done. This holds here as well. Uh, inverse images of open sets are open with a quick little observation. We're talking inverse images here. We're not talking inverse functions. Nobody said this function F was one to one and hence that it even has an inverse. It deals with something different. It deals with inverse images not inverse functions, as you see in senior level analysis. Okay, in the notes, we've had uh, 
fairly liberal use of epsilons so far because I like epsilons. Uh, the book makes, I think it's first epsilon definition in the following. It could have used epsilon sooner <clears throat> and, and we have. So we're trying to define not just continuity, but uniform continuity here. Function F mapping norm linear space X to norm linear space Y as discussed above is uniformly continuous if for all epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero, depending on epsilon and not on input value X, depending only on epsilon, such that for all X inputs, we have F of ball of center X and radius delta is a subset of a ball of center F of X and radius epsilon. So here we've specifically got uh, distances introduced because they're using the metric and these um, inputs of uh, input values within delta of x and output values within epsilon of f of x. These are very much distances. They just described it in terms of balls of certain centers and certain radii, but you're still talking about input values and output values that are within a certain distance, delta or epsilon, of whatever the center is, input value and output value in this case. So they're saying to paraphrase, we've got uniform continuity when for any epsilon, I can tell you what delta needs to be without ever knowing what X is. I can choose a delta given an epsilon that will work uniformly throughout norm linear space X. No matter where X is in this space, the delta that I've chosen when you gave me epsilon, to think of it as a game like that, my delta is gonna work all the time. You don't have to tell me where X is. That's quite different from pointwise continuity, though subtly so, says for a given X value, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, blah, blah, blah. Here, you're not given the X value. You're simply given the epsilon and able to find the delta that works for all X in norm linear space, capital X. This is the uniform part, the for all throughout, uniformly throughout norm linear space X. So we, that's what uniform continuity is. Of course, <clears throat> if we have uniform continuity, then you've got continuity at every point from the old fashioned epsilon delta definition of continuity or our um, new and improved version using balls B and B prime than we had before. But the converse doesn't hold. We can find a function that's pointwise continuous. Take the function F mapping the um, positive reals to the positive reals defined by F of X equals one over X. It's continuous. The only place it have a problem is zero and we've eliminated that problem by simply excluding zero from the conversation. So you've got continuity, but it's not uniformly continuous. Why is that? Well, just between you and me, it's because this has a vertical asymptote at X equals zero and you get this real steepness to the function. It's that unbounded steepness that violates the, um, the uniform continuity where the function is um, relatively shallow, where it's not, not very steep, uh, I can find you deltas given epsilons. But where it gets really steep, I can't find a delta for a corresponding epsilon unless you'll tell me what that input value is because the relationship between epsilon and delta is related to the steepness of the curve. It's related to the slopes of tangents. If it's differentiable, it's related to the derivative. And the problem is the derivative is unbounded for this function because it's got a vertical asymptote at zero. We don't do anything at zero here, but we take positive numbers in and I can make the slope of this get as large as I want using positive inputs. It's, it's unbounded using positive inputs. And that's the problem in terms of uniform continuity. Okay, I'm deviating a little bit from um, the book's 
definition here on the closure of a set. They give uh, five properties, which they say are equivalent. I'm going to pick one as the definition of uh, the closure of the set and state some things that are equivalent to that. For A, a set in a normed linear space, the closure of A is the intersection of all closed sets containing A, denoted A closure. All right, uh, you know, well, if you believe what you learned in senior level algebra, uh, an arbitrary intersection of closed sets is closed. So in fact, A closure really is a closed set. Uh, so this is a, a reasonable thing to define as the closure of the set first off. The next theorem says, we have these following things as well, these following equivalent conditions. I can express, express the closure of A in some other ways. Those ways include A closure equals the union of A and all of its boundary points. A closure is all vectors X in vector space, normal linear vector space, capital X, uh, such that for all R greater than zero, a ball centered at X if radius r intersect a is non-empty, which reminds me of limit points. Uh, if x is not an a, then such an x value is going to be a boundary point. Uh, if x is an a, then certainly these conditions are satisfied by point x itself. So uh, that uh, jives with part one actually fairly well. If you look at the definition of boundary point, <clears throat> for set A. Uh, thirdly, actually this is probably the most useful one. Uh, we'll use it in some of the proofs. A closure is all X in the norm linear space such that there's a sequence A sub N and X with A sub N approaching X. So we can take a sequence of elements of the set that converge to X. All such X in the space are elements of A closure. Uh, in fact, that could be a constant sequence. If we take a point that's in A, if X is in A itself, we could simply take the sequence X, 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 X. That gets included here. Of course, A closure, it includes all the points in A. Along with other points, they're, they're actually classified up here, uh, along with uh, boundary points. Now, some of the boundary points could have been in set A as well, and maybe some of them weren't. Depends on what kind of set set A is. And fourthly, we can use uh, the metric. Uh, this is nice. By the way, that metric is defined in terms of norms of vectors, right? The metric induced by the norm. That's what we're talking about here when we say norm linear space. It says A closure equals all X in the space such that the distance from X to set A equals zero. So we talked about in the first section of this chapter, uh, defining a distance between a point and a set. And we showed with a specific example that distance could be zero, and yet we might not have an element of set A. Now, you know what you got? If you got a uh, point X that's distance zero from set A, and it's not in set A, must be a boundary point. That we couldn't say, because we didn't have all these definitions before. Uh, it's to be proved in one of the exercises that all these things are equivalent to each other. The definition and, and these other four properties. Okay, now we're going to show something that seems a little weird. Um, we're going to show the open ball with center X and radius R actually is an open set. That's why it's called the open ball. Uh, it actually is an open set. We're going to use our definition of open. And we're going to show the closure of the open ball with center X and radius R is the closed ball with center X and radius R. Well, that should be geometrically pretty satisfying. It's just a matter of putting together a rigorous mathy argument about it. What's the difference in these two sets? I've alleged the only difference is um, the boundary of this ball all vectors that are distance exactly R from X. This includes all vectors that are less than, strictly less than R, distance R from X. And this includes those that are distance less than or equal to R. So the real difference between these two is simply the boundary, if you will. Now I should be more careful with that term. Boundary point has a specific meaning. 
Let's look at the proof of that. Okay, first claim. Ball centered at X with radius R is an open set. All right, <clears throat> that little picture here really gives away what we need to do. We need to show if we choose Y, any element of this open ball of center X and radius R, that, well, here it is here, that there's an open ball centered at Y of some radius that's a subset of the given open set. So in green, we have, it's a pretty legitimate picture in R2, but schematically, we're using this idea for any non-linear space. In green, we've got the boundary, I didn't bother to shade the interior, but we've got the boundary of um, this circle centered at X, there's a center and radius R. R must be the distance to the green circle. Choose Y, an arbitrary point. We wanna find the black circle. We wanna find a radius where if we take a ball centered at Y with that radius, we're gonna call it S, then that's a subset of the green disc, as it were, the green open disc. So that's the motivational picture. Here's the math. We've chosen Y to be in the ball centered at X with radius R, open ball. So the norm of Y minus X is strictly less than R. That's how that ball is defined. So there's a positive number S such that S is less than R minus norm of X minus one. Uh, simply the fact that uh, this real number is strictly less than that one. So there's a real number somewhere in between them, call it S, do some rearranging and we'll get this relationship here. Uh, and that's what will guarantee the geometry that's given in the picture but we need to check the math. Okay, so um, choose Z to be in the ball of center Y and radius S. That means the norm of Z minus Y is strictly less than S, open ball, centered at Y, radius S. So we're saying the distance from Z to Y is strictly less than S. That's saying it's inside that little ball. Then we get the following. The norm of Z minus X, let's write that as uh, Z minus Y plus Y minus X, that little trick of adding and subtracting the same thing. So that doesn't change anything. Apply the triangle inequality over this vector addition symbol here. That gives us these two things. Hey, the norm of Z minus Y we had was less than S. So we get this bounded by S, less than S. Norm of Y minus X, uh, if we rearrange this, take this to the other side, we'll have the norm of um, Y minus X or X minus Y, less than R minus S. Take this to the other side and take the S to the right-hand side. You'll get R minus S on the right-hand side. There is R minus S is an upper bound. Do the arithmetic here, the S is canceled, you get R. We just showed if Z is in this little black disc, then the distance from Z to X is strictly less than R. That means Z is inside the green disc, the open green disc. Z was an arbitrary point in the ball of center Y and radius S. So we've actually shown that that ball is a subset of, of that disc, is a subset of this disc. The black open disc is a subset of the green open disc. Ball of center Y radius S is a subset of the ball center X radius R. So Y is an interior point of the ball center X and radius R. We chose an arbitrary Y in that ball and showed it's an interior point. That's our definition of open. That's our definition of open. So it's open if every point of the set is an interior point. Okay. So the open ball of center X and radius R, in fact, is an open set. So not very groundbreaking stuff, but really just confirming uh, we're using the right terminology and we're taking the right approach here. Secondly, we wanna show the closure of the open ball, XR is the closed ball, X 
comma r. Closure, we had a bunch of different things equivalent to closure. So we're going to use more than one. Consider a sequence z sub n, let this be a sequence, and the closed ball x center x radius r that converges to z. In other words, let z be a limit point of the closed ball b bar x r. Then if you'll consider the sequence, put parentheses around these to indicate sequences, the sequence z sub n minus x, well, that sequence converges. Just subtracted x from all the entries. The z sub n's converge to z. That's how we set it up. So the sequence z sub n minus x converges to z minus x. So we've got this as a limit of a different sequence. <clears throat> Continuity of norm. There in 2.3.c uh, said the limit of a norm x sub n equals the limit of x itself. It says the limit of the norm of these equals the norm of that. Kind of allowed you to pass limits inside norms. That's why it's called continuity. So what we get then is um, the norm of z minus x equals uh, the limit of the norm here. Hey, we've got uh, z sub n minus x, that's bounded by r, because z sub n was a bunch of uh, points, vectors, inside the ball of center x and radius r, closed ball. So how far is z sub n from x at most r, possibly equaling bar, um, possibly equaling r because of the bar over the b, it's closed ball. So we get z sub n minus x is less than or equal to r. That holds for all indices. So upon taking the limit of the norm, we get that the limit of the norm is bounded by norm of z minus x is bounded by r also because we get equality of the limit of these terms and all of these terms are less than r, less than or equal to r. So we just showed that if z is a limit point, of the closed ball, center x and radius r, then z is an element of the closed ball of center x and radius r. We assumed it was a limit point and showed it's actually in the set. Well, that shows this set contains all its limit points. We observed, this is why we introduced that idea from senior level analysis, if a set includes all its limit points, then it's a closed set. So the closed ball of center X and radius R actually is a closed set. First off, well, hopefully so, or else that's a bad name for it. Now we had defined uh, the closure of a set to be the intersection of all closed sets containing that set. This is one of the closed sets containing that set. So this contains the intersection of all those closed sets in particular, the closed ball contains the closure of the open ball. Now this is a bit subtle because the verbiage is so suggested, but we're talking about two sets. We're talking about the, read this as a, almost a single statement. We're talking about the set, which is the closure of B of XR. And we're talking about this set here, B bar XR. We're trying to show this set, closure B of XR, equals this set. We just showed B bar X R contains the closure of B of X R. Now we need to reverse that containment to draw the conclusion of is, to draw the conclusion of equality of those two sets. So we're halfway there. All right, so next we wanna show um, the closure of the open ball contains the closed ball. All right, so conversely, if y minus x and norm equals r, okay, so we're looking at, uh, if you will, the uh, vector y that's on the boundary of the closed ball. Define the sequence y sub n to be x plus one minus one over n y minus x. Certainly there's some suggestive geometry to that. Let's just look at the algebra that follows though. Then if we look at y sub n minus y in norm, all right, that'd be um, this minus what we have over there. Uh, 
sorry, that would be um, this minus X. I shouldn't say take this, subtract X, you lose that and you keep this part here. So the difference is this quantity here. So we got the norm of what's stated here. Scalar property allows you to bring that coefficient out front. You're left with norm of Y minus X. This scalar strictly less than one for any natural number. So we get a strictly less than norm of Y minus X. Uh, norm of Y minus X is R. So we just showed Y sub N minus X in norm is less than R. Why don't we do all of that? To show Y sub N is within a distance R of X strictly less than. In other words, Y sub N is in the open ball centered at X and radius R. So we've got a sequence of elements of the open ball. By the continuity of addition and scalar multiplication, specifically theorems 2.3a and b, pass limits over uh, sums and scalar multiplication. We proved the scalar multiplication part. The limit of y sub n, that would be, we got the y sub n's expressed up here, the limit of x plus 1 minus 1 over n quantity times y minus x um, would be the limit of the sum. So we get the limit of X, which is simply a constant. We get X itself. Uh, limit of Y minus X is simply Y minus X. This uh, one over N, N goes to infinity, going to go to one. So we lose that term. The limit of this sequence is simply X plus Y minus N. The X's we lose, and that's Y itself. We've got Y sub N equals Y. Definition of closure part three says y is in the closure of this open ball because we took a sequence of elements, y sub n, here we go, in the open ball, and we found their limit. We found a limit point of the open ball. And we've shown that um, that limit point Let's see why we know that's in the closure. Oh, here we go. Um, let's see, we took Y on the boundary. Sorry. We've taken Y on the boundary of really the boundary of the open ball. And we've shown it's the limit of a sequence of points inside. I mean, not surprising, right? You've chosen something on the boundary. You could certainly find a sequence of points that converges to it from inside that open ball. So that's the geometry of what's going on here. But we've shown um, as such, why is the limit of a sequence of points? So it's, a, it's in the closure. Part three of the definition of closure or part three of that theorem 2.2.a more precisely, um, told us that um, the closure includes all the limit points. We've shown we've got a limit point. So the closure has to include that. So the closure of this ball has to include all such y, all y's exactly distance r from x, the boundary of the ball. So the closure contains everything within distance r of x. If it's strictly less than, then there are points in the set, and the closure of a set includes everything in this set. And now we've shown that this also includes everything on the, if you will, the boundary of this set. Again, a suggestive term with a specific meaning, but I like the geometric suggestions. And we've shown now the closure of the open ball contains a closed ball. Previous slide, we showed it the other way around. We showed the closed ball contains the closure of the open ball. So those two things are equal. And that's what was claimed. So the closure of this set is the closed ball. Not surprising technical stuff to show. A new idea for us. In a non-linear space X, set Y is said to be dense in X if Y closure equals X itself. And you probably dealt with these ideas in senior level analysis. Uh, if we'll take X to be RN, then we could take set Y to be a QN. You know, the rationals are dense in the reals. QN is dense in RN, if you like. Ooh, neat thing happens there. Um, these rational numbers are countable we found a countable dense subset of Rn by looking at this Qn. 
but there's an example of denseness. Uh, this will be useful in the future when we look at LP spaces. There's that idea first, I think, mentioned in writing. Uh, by theorem 2.2.a part three, if y is dense in x, then for all x vectors in space x, there exists a sequence y sub n subset of set x such that y sub n converges to x. So when you have a dense subset, you can approximate elements of the big space x by the little dense subspace y. You can approximate real numbers with rational numbers as close as you like. In other words, you can find a sequence of rational numbers that converges to any irrational number or any real number more generally. So if we've got a continuous function on set x, maybe that function is easily evaluated on elements of uh, y. We can use the values of f on y along with limits to determine the value of the function on x. f of x can be written as a limit of f of y sub n's where the y sub n's approach x. Think in terms of applications that um, maybe we want um, a numerical approximation of pi. Well, you can approximate pi with rational numbers. For rational numbers, functions are easier to evaluate than they are for irrational numbers. Um, but we could, in a limiting sense, so I eliminate the limit, I make n large, and then I'm doing an approximation. If I'm really doing applied math, I need to know how good that approximation is. So I need error estimates. But anyhow, this can be motivated uh, actually from applications. We're taking um, nice numbers for which we can evaluate the function and using those in a limit, maybe to evaluate functions at uh, not so nice numbers, irrational numbers, transcendental numbers. Uh, we'll deal with uh, countable dense subsets of uh, Bonnock spaces before it's over with an example of which is LP spaces. And we were chatting about that at the beginning of the section. And the final topic and the many topics in this section is uh, compactness. Promislu makes a comment, page 17. One of the most important concepts of analysis is that, is that of compactness. Now you're familiar with this in the setting of the reels from senior level analysis one. There's properties of compact sets of real numbers that don't hold everywhere. They won't hold in, well, we'll classify where they hold and where they don't before we're done. But you might be used to the heine borel theorem that tells you a compact set of real numbers is closed and bounded. And a closed and bounded set of real numbers is compact. In the setting of real numbers, compact if and only if closed and bounded. But you ain't gonna spend the rest of your mathematical career in the real numbers. There's other more exotic places. And in those places, the heine borel theorem doesn't hold. So definition as stated here, the first part will be familiar to you from senior level analysis. The second part might be familiar to you, uh, more likely if you've dealt in a metric, uh, metric spaces in more detail than possibly the second part. But a set K, a uh, subset of a norm linear space is compact if either of the following two equivalent properties hold. Uh, Promise Lowe is big on um, saying we have the following which are equivalent. We take any one of these as a definition. Yeah, you need to establish the equivalence if you're going to do that. First, given any collection of open sets with union containing K, in fact, this is called an open cover of K, there is a finite subcollection of these sets which cover K. Every open cover of K has a finite subcover. These collections of open sets are called open covers. So we can abbreviate this. Sets compact if every open cover has a finite subcover. Now, what's important about open sets isn't that when we're talking, sorry, what's important about compact sets isn't when we're talking real numbers that they're closed and bounded. It's that this thing happens. Every open cover has a finite subcover. In some sense that you're made 
aware of in senior level analysis, you can kind of make a transition from the infinite to the finite when dealing with compact sets. Here it is explicitly arbitrary collection of open sets, finite subcover. But you can say things like this. For a compact set, um, say of real numbers, there's a maximum and a minimum. Compact set of real numbers has a maximum and a minimum. If I don't have a compact set, I might still have an upper bound and a lower bound. I might even have a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound but I can't talk about the maximum of a set of real numbers. I can talk about the maximum of a compact set of real numbers. There's sort of that transition from talking about supremum to talking about maximum. And you can do that when you have compact sets. The extreme value theorem from calculus one says a continuous function on a something set has a maximum and a minimum. Uh, it justifies all those max min problems you do in calculus one. In calculus one, you do those max min problems oftentimes on closed and bounded intervals. Not always, but oftentimes on closed and bounded intervals. The extreme value theorem says a continuous function on a closed and bounded interval attains a maximum and a minimum. Yeah, um, we could talk about soups and imps of function values but not maxes and mins unless you know more properties. And compactness is a property of the input set that'll guarantee continuous functions attain a maximum and attain a minimum. Uh, a second property, which is claimed to be equivalent to the first uh, for a set being compact is the following. For any sequence of vectors in set X, there's a subsequence X sub n sub K introduce a second um, subscript indicate a subsequence of the first sequence. There's a subsequence con which converges to a point in X. So every sequence of elements of K may not converge to K, but they have a subsequence which converges to a point in K. This is sometimes called sequentially compact. It's explored in um, this would be something we cover in graduate real analysis too, if we did a lot of stuff on metric spaces. Uh, in fact, in um, Royden and Fitzpatrick's real analysis book, these two things are shown to be equivalent. Uh, so there's our justification that one and two actually are equivalent in metric space setting. Uh, we'll probably chat mostly about this first property Compact means every open cover has a finite subcover. We're going to use this in a quick little proof downstairs. Uh, so this is on the table as well. All right, let's uh, have one final result. The compact set theorem. It's going to remind you of the Heine Borel theorem. It says uh, for A, <clears throat> sorry, for K, a subset of X, a norm linear space. K is compact. If K is compact, then K is closed and bounded. So if compact, then closed and bounded. The Heine Borel theorem says for the real numbers, if compact, then closed and bounded, and if closed and bounded, then compact. Compact if and only if closed and bounded, Heine Borel would say, yeah, Heine Borel's right in the setting of the real numbers. Heine Burrell's wrong if we try to take this to more exotic settings. In fact, the Heine Burrell theorem holds in RN. Uh, in RN, where you've spent much of your background uh, as an undergraduate, <clears throat> and you do your analysis in RN, linear algebra in RN, uh, in finite dimensional spaces, Heine Burrell holds. Uh, set is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. But there's other places. There's infinite dimensional vector spaces. L2 is one of them. We've mentioned that before. Where there's a closed and bounded set and that set is not compact. By which I mean there's an open cover that doesn't have a finite subcover. We will establish that. We'll draw pictures of it and make it very geometric and very plausible. But Compact and closed and bounded are not equivalent everywhere. 
They're equivalent in the real numbers. In fact, they're equivalent in finite dimensional spaces, but not all spaces are finite dimensional. Heine Burrell, there's a real punchline, holds in finite dimensional spaces. Half of it holds everywhere. If we have a compact set, then that set is closed and bounded. It's the converse of that that doesn't hold. So let's go through a proof. Now we have <clears throat> the claim, if compact, then closed and bounded. Suppose compact, assume compact, and suppose not bounded. So we're going for a contradiction to compactness in this. Fix some A in our linear space X, then for any natural number, consider the complement of a ball centered at A with radius N. Since the set's not bounded, this is the exterior of a bounded set, it must be that this complement of this ball contains some element of set K. Call that K sub N. Do so for each natural number N, creating a sequence K sub N, and this sequence diverges to infinity. A uh, brief comment, sequences of real numbers can diverge in two different ways. They can diverge and be bounded, just bounce around a lot, or they can diverge because they take off to infinity. We know this sequence must take off to infinity because of the way it's created, as these exteriors of larger and larger balls with the same center, A. Uh, so we get divergence of the sequence, um, it's an unbounded sequence. Part two, of the definition of compact would tell us that that sequence would have to have a subsequence that converges to some element of K. But it can't. That sequence diverges to infinity. Every subsequence will also diverge to infinity. There can be no convergent subsequence. So there can be no subsequence that converges to an element of K because of the divergence to infinity property. Well, that implies K is not compact, and that's a contradiction. Uh, K was hypothesized to be compact, so the assumption that K is not bounded is false, and there's the proof that K is in fact bounded. So if K is compact, then K is bounded. Now let's deal with uh, the closed part. Let X be an element of K closure. We're working under the hypotheses that K is compact. Then theorem 2.2.a part three says there's a sequence X sub n in K such that X sub n converges to X. Uh, X or K closure consists of um, all limit points of set K. So if we choose X to be in K closure, then there's a sequence of elements of K that converges to X, part two of that theorem. Uh, definition of compact part two then tells you there's a subsequence X sub n sub K of X sub n, which converges to a point in K, as we were just talking. But X sub n sub K must converge to, uh, to X itself. It's a subsequence of a sequence that converges to X and so converges to X itself. Well, we chose X to be in K closure. All right, so if X is in K closure, we just decided X must be in K itself. So uh, K contains K closure. Of course, K closure contains K as well. So we can draw the conclusion that K equals K closure and K its closure, of course, is closed, so K itself is closed. So if compact, then um, bounded by the first paragraph, if compact, then closed by the second paragraph. So in a norm planar space, uh, if compact, then closed and bounded. Converse doesn't hold. Converse only holds in finite dimensions, and we'll establish that later. And that takes care of uh, this section. We had a parting comments, but we took care of that earlier. Uh, have a nice day. We'll move on to section uh, 2.3 next, and it's a little bit briefer than this one since this was a lengthy one. See you there.